few will imagine that this complex of buildings is in fact a powerhouse of intense intellectual activity. The Delhi School of Economics was guided in its early years almost single-handedly by Dr. V. K. R. V. Rao and nurtured by professors with a pioneering spirit as the school in those days had only a few facilities and was short of funds. This was an institution which came as part of this great wave of enthusiasm, idealism, which were generated around the independence period. Since its foundation in 1948, the economists at the D School, as it is popularly known, have initiated debates that have gone on to influence government policy formulation. The need for liberalization of the Indian economy was first mooted at the D School. The ability to anticipate and influence patterns of thought is a distinctive character of the people from here. The theory of social choice, for example, which analyzed the consistency of individual choice vis-a-vis -vis the social one, was crystallized here. Several professors at the school were involved with policy making. Professor K. N. Raj, for instance, played a significant role in the drafting of the second five-year plan. No less than four professors have served as members of the National Planning Commission. It also gave India an education minister in Dr. Rao and a finance minister in Dr. Manmohan Singh. For more than 30 years, I've been associated with scholars from this school. The education here is very rigorous in terms of world class teaching. It's up to, up to the minute in uh, modern uh, techniques and modern ideas. The reinforced interaction between teaching and research is what the D school has come to value. Bringing in a balance between theory and applied work to tackle various problems through analysis, conceptualization and empirical vigor. It is really the pleasure of uh, pursuing one's interest according to one's light. It is, that is what openness that I talked about, both in teaching and research, which makes this place really exciting. My juniors can also tell me, and often do, that what I am saying is uh, nonsense. I think that freedom to say that uh, what one is talking is nonsense and reasoning out why it is nonsense and the capacity to accept that it could be nonsense and if it is nonsense, one has to accept it. I think it is that openness, that plurality, plural, uh, that is what essentially keeps this place going. impression that I get is it's a place where you really have to put in a lot of effort. I mean hard work is eventually pays in the end. But more importantly, not just the hard work, but it's also the fun, how we effectively manage our time to combine both your work and your extracurricular activities to end up with a sort of a great curriculum which really develops a personality on the whole. The Indian Institute of Management goes way beyond personality development. Rated as one of the toughest management programs in the world to get into, it trains students to achieve socially responsive professional management skills. The formative years witnessed a collaboration with the Harvard Business School. 
largely as a consequence of this collaboration, the case method of teaching forms the backbone of training at the Institute. The Institute was set up in 1961 with the efforts of the noted scientist and industrialist Dr. Bikram Sarabhai. Early in its history, its identity was shaped more along the lines of a school of management than a school of business. We make them responsive because we ask them, every class when I go, I pick up somebody and say that you were Mr. So-and-so and facing that situation, what would be your action? So he just doesn't have any choice but to. And when he gives a response, somebody else might have a different point of view. So it is uh, at that point your ideas you are trying to convince to somebody else. Because we believe that a good idea might get totally lost if it cannot be communicated right way to the others. More than 3,000 cases of real-life management situations have been published along with papers and books. More than 25,000 managers from India and abroad have been trained here. Every year, the Institute provides consultancy services to international organizations such as the World Bank and the UN agencies. The Ravi Mathai Center for Educational Innovation was set up to promote institutional building. It rejuvenates various organizations with systems, processes and values to help them achieve optimum efficiency. Nearly 80 institutions, mainly schools and colleges, were assisted by the Institute. Leading multinationals or private and public sector companies arrive at the campus to get the best management professionals in the land to join them. From agriculture to education, from health to transportation, from energy to population control. The Indian Institute of Management has made a difference in the management of various vital sectors of the economy. The Institute trains its students to have a more pragmatic, plausible and positive approach to their work. India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, said that a university stands for humanism, for tolerance, for reason, for the adventure of ideas, and for the search of truth. It stands for the onward march of the human race towards ever higher objectives. And helping India march towards those higher objectives is the School of Social Sciences part of the Jawaharlal Nehru University, built to harmonize with the Aravali hills that surround it. The accent at the school is on stimulating the spirit of critical inquiry amongst its students. Its various centers conduct postgraduate courses on subjects that include regional development, social and community health, and educational studies. One of the major problems that we're facing in India was uh, which way should uh, people develop? What are the points of focus? People felt that the traditional approach in, in many of these areas was not particularly helpful and you needed some kind of an integrated approach or what uh, people those days used to call an interdisciplinary approach. The Centre for Historical Studies, among the oldest at the JNU, 
makes the study of history more meaningful in the country's changing intellectual and social climate. The center has played a crucial role in shifting the focus from a politico-administrative history to a socio-economic history. Students are encouraged to react passionately to contemporary events, an approach that has helped many of those who went on to become politicians or journalists. The Center for Political Studies deals with the study of the Indian political process. And at the Center for Social Systems, problems related to social change as a result of development and modernization are the main focus. The Center for Social Medicine and Community Health investigates health problems affecting the various communities. The Center for Regional Development looks specifically into the nature and reasons for uneven development in different parts of the country. I think they're really good. I mean, very well structured. Uh, I can take excellent notes, clear notes. So I, I really like the teaching because they, they talk very slowly as well. You can really follow. There's a logic behind it. The relevance of the School of Social Sciences continues to increase in contemporary India. Its education has come to be associated with the kind of education that gave ancient India its reputation as the land of the wise. In the early years of India's independence, Charles Eames and his wife Ray were invited to India to initiate a training for design as an aid for small-scale industries. In the process, they discovered an advanced ancient tradition in design, used for centuries with great skill. The National Institute of Design was created to breathe new life in the process of renewal and discovery. The Institute aims at sensitizing the nation to the relevance of design in creating a better environment. It inspires its students to work within a framework that is constantly changing. Over the past three decades, the alumni have proved their merit in many areas of social importance. Their main achievement has been the ability to incorporate the theoretical principles into real-life work conditions. Realizing the potential of design to make the transition from tradition to modernity, the National Institute of Design strives to provide a comprehensive training program in various walks of life. The students and teachers work together at all stages in this endeavor of learning. The professional courses of the Institute are divided into three main academic divisions. One is the Industrial Design Division, which has product design and furniture design. Graphic design, video programming 
and animation design are areas of specialization in the communication design division. One division is dedicated to textile design and apparel design. Here, from the warp and the weft to the final garment, the student is taught all aspects of textile design. The institute is also involved in many design projects in various areas. These include health, education, and environmental conservation. The Rural University project in Rajasthan, the conservation projects in Fatehpur Sikri and Hampi, bear testimony to these endeavors. The work done by NID and its alumni have won many honors. In 1985, the National Institute of Design received the prestigious World Design Award for Future Visions in Design from the International Council of Societies of Industrial Design. The efforts of the early visionaries who implanted this young profession but old art form firmly into Indian soil are beginning to bear fruit. India is the inheritor of one of the most resplendent architectural legacies. The nation can proudly lay claim to a tradition of technical finesse in this field that's over 2,000 years old. As a profession, architecture was still in its infancy in India at the time of independence. The building of the new capital exposed the acute shortage of architects in the land. Walter George, a British architect and his contemporaries, made efforts to establish what is today known as the School of Planning and Architecture. The objective was to combine the art with the profession. The education at the school deals with the design and construction of buildings in their sociological, technical and environmental context. The turning point came when Pilu Modi, Member of Parliament and himself an architect, brought about the Architects' Registration Act, by which it became obligatory for any building to be designed by an architect. Today, as a profession, architecture is linked with the single largest sector of investment. The remote sensing laboratory enables the students to interpret aerial photographs and satellite images. These modern techniques are indispensable tools for mapping and layout planning. The Center for Study of Systems Analyses serves as a national resource for institutions associated with planning and architecture. A state-of-the-art computer-aided design unit customizes software according to the requirement of the user. The audiovisual unit at the school has prepared and mounted exhibitions at various locations in India and abroad. It has a complete range of facilities for the filming and documentation of color and black and white images. Modern Indian building is also earning a respect from the West, from other countries, because we have been able to establish a quality of architecture which is not a copy of the West, but which is a genuine interpretation of Indian 
requirements and Indian architectural styles. The school undertakes research in transport planning, urban design, landscape architecture, and building engineering and management. Some of the real-life projects done by the students include designing low-cost housing in cyclone and flood-prone areas. The students of the school have repeatedly won the International Association of Landscape Architects Award in the last four years. The planning and management of human settlement is becoming increasingly complex in the present age. Good architecture never dies. It has the capacity to inspire people for thousands of years. And at the School of Planning and Architecture, students are trained to achieve the highest artistic standards. If anyone teaches me a word of education, till my end of life, I will be his disciple, and I will grade him. So which, which one is his our leader? He says this type of command. What about us? We are followers of him. And uh, Rasul Akram, Salawatullah also, he says, you go for knowledge if it is in China. In those days, there were not communication, easy communication. It means you have to go and learn wherever it is. And it was to learn that Ahmad Raza Behaduri came to Pune from Iran. He's not just another foreign student at an Indian university. He belongs to the growing number of students who come to study under the international collaborative programs at the University of Pune. At any given time, it has more than 2,000 foreign students studying in different colleges and in university departments. The university has several collaborative programs with universities abroad. Among them are the universities of York, Manchester and East Anglia. It also has agreements with the universities of Pennsylvania, Central Queensland, Florida and Calgary. We started in 93, in a bigger way. Previously, we used to admit very few. 93, it was a, done in a bigger way. Even today, it's only 10% seats in arts and commerce. In science, it's only 5%. And this is over and above the normal quota. So if this college has 100 students, they can admit five additional foreign students. So no Indian student loses a seat. The Indian Technical and Economic Cooperative Program, ITEC, was launched in 1964 as a bilateral program of assistance of the Government of India. Under it, and the Special Commonwealth African Assistance Program, SCAP, over 127 countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America are invited to share in the Indian experience, technology and skill development. It is a part of the South-South cooperation effort conducted through projects, training, study visits, and deputation of experts, among others. The training is relevant to the governments of developing countries for improving the skills and performance of their personnel through in-service training and capacity enhancement at various levels. Today, India is the world leader in film production. Indian cinema has completed a hundred years and is still going strong. Withstanding the test of time and circumstance, the industry today produces nearly 800 films annually. 
The Film and Television Institute of India was established by the government in 1960, following the recommendation of the Film Inquiry Committee for imparting training in the art and techniques of filmmaking. The Television Training Division started originally in New Delhi and was then shifted to Pune in 1974. The Prabhat Studio, belonging to the legend of the Indian film industry, B. Shantaram, forms the core complex of the Institute. The film wing provides technical training in the production of serials and films. It provides practical training in all aspects of filmmaking. The Institute has sophisticated sound recording machines, editing machines and movie cameras. There is also a film archive containing both Indian and foreign films, apart from those made by the students of the Institute. The daily viewing gives the students an opportunity to absorb the best in world cinema, from Satyajit Rai to Steven Spielberg. Even diploma films made as projects by the students make it to many international film festivals. The alumni of this institute are responsible for the world-class quality of many Indian films. <laughs> 